Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. Annie Laurie and I are co presidents of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters. For those of us who are not religious or just curious about non believers, we invite you to join FFRF in our work to educate the public about non theism and to protect the vital wall of separation between state and church. Request a sample copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today or visit our website at FFRF.org. Jeremiah Kamara is the director and producer of the new documentary, Holy Hierarchy, The Religious Roots of Racism in America, as well as the film, Contradiction. Jeremiah is the author of books, Holy Lockdown, Does the Church Limit Black Progress? and The New Doubting Thomas, The Bible, Black Folks, and Blind Faith. He's also the creator of the widely watched YouTube series, Slave Sermons. Dan got a chance to sit down with Jeremiah when he spoke recently at FFRF's National Convention. But first, let's watch the trailer for Jeremiah's film, Contradiction, which is now streaming on Amazon Prime. Where would black folk be without the church? Where would black people be without our faith in God? They say the church is a hospital for sick people. Are there too many churches in black communities? But what's causing all the sickness? The devil is ruling this world. What is that you're smoking? I want to always challenge our churches to do better. I talk to God. Gamble, drink, go to church. Who started the Baptist denomination? The church preys on women. Because we're more emotional. I mean, people don't ever want to question why they even go to church. Go up and faith, wait for you. Culturally, you are compelled to believe. They say prayer brings about changes in our lives. And if we ask, we will receive. Everything I need is already taken care of. Yes, yes Jesus, I believe. But everything in the Bible happens. Some of it is true. Ayla. They say these are the last days and that when we get to heaven, all the pain and suffering will be gone. I, I don't want to go to hell. They say have faith. Go to There's church. plenty more people going to hell. Right. So, Jeremiah Kamara, welcome to Free Thought Matters. Thanks for having me. Good that, to be here. That was a powerful trailer that we just saw of your movie, Contradiction, and a powerful movie. And uh, basically, it's about the contradiction is, here's all these churches and neighborhoods that are doing so badly. Yeah, why are there so many churches in, in black communities? Why are the black communities uh, saturated with churches? And is there a correlation between high praise and low productivity. You know, why are there these churches and the powerlessness and the poverty in, in black communities? And that's what it basically takes a look, look at. So I, I think there's no question that there is a correlation. I mean, you can see it, you know, demographically, but you raise the question of is there a causation? Is there, is there some reason why? Is there some cause for the most depressed parts of the country to be the most, you know, how, how, have a church and a, and a liquor store on every corner, yeah. you point out. Well, you know, blacks have been conditioned to seek answers from the supernatural. And so over the years, uh, blacks have looked at prayer and faith and worshiped as pragmatic, practical solutions for solving problems. And so one of the things I think is that blacks have really had trouble problem solving because prayer is not a solution. Uh, but it's a very um, quick come up. You know, we saw the churches in Chicago, especially uh, LA, Washington, and it's crazy because some, most of the streets that we were on that had the most black churches was called Division Avenue for some uh -huh. reason. And uh, Chicago, there were churches next door, uh, adjacent, down the street. I mean, we literally, filmed about 200 and something churches on three streets. Yeah, in just a couple blocks. So to tell the story that, hey, I was down, I was once this, and now Jesus lift me up. You know, blacks get kind of excited about that story, but you, you can't continue to do something that you've been doing 
um, for decades and expecting some different results. So we see the empirical evidence just doesn't line up with the churches being, you know, so prevalent in the black community. Well, could it partly be the fact that churches are a good way for a few people, namely the pastors, to make a living? I mean, some of them are making a good living in these depressed areas. It's a quick come up. And it, it doesn't require a lot of, I won't say effort, but it's relatively simply to get ordained and, you know, become an ordained minister and call yourself a minister. Um, one of the things I noticed, too, uh, when blacks apply for loans t for businesses, it's a lot more difficult than it is applying for a loan for a church. You apply for a loan for a church, you're more likely to get it because oh. they have this build and we know they will come a mentality uh, for the church. In a sense, there's a lot of truth to that. And so it is a lot of money for the pastors. You know, blacks um, since 1980 have uh, given the churches $420 billion in aggregate. In the U.S.? In the United States. And that pans out to $250 million on average a week that's going into the churches. And Come, there's just not a lot of lot to show for it. Coming out of the pockets of people who don't have deep pockets. I mean, coming out of the pockets for people who don't have deep pockets. Uh, was one pastor in Atlanta who asked for uh, sixty-five million dollars for a jet. I think he got seventy million. Uh, and the street that he's on in Atlanta is in need of uh, revitalization. Division you know? Street. <laughs> it's not. It's actually called uh, Old National. Ah. Uh. Uh, well, that's the name of a bank, too. Yeah, it's huh. the name of a bank. Well, his name is Creflo Dollar, so it oh, all goes okay. together there. So that's not a bad gig. I mean, maybe we're in the wrong business here. My wife always tells me huh. that. She said, you could have made a lot of money. I think when we were in the <laughs> Philippines. Uh, that's where we met, right? That's where we met. Uh, Norm, was it Norm? Norm Allen. Norm Allen. Yeah. He called me the reverse preacher <laughs> <laughs> because I had the, the fervor and the passion, but it was on the, op the opposite message. So what was your upbringing and background? You were religious? Not really. I mean, we went to church. We weren't Bible thumpers or anything like that. My parents did uh, allow me some freedom not to go to church. They didn't bash it in me. Sometime they went. I said I didn't want to go. It was okay with them. Did you believe any of that stuff? I did. Uh, earlier, I've been this way since I was 21, though. So I don't really have that coming out story yeah. or that story of breaking through uh, and, uh, through the family and, and letting my parents know what I was and the f backlash that I got from friends and family. I don't have that story. I've been mm -hmm. doing this for so long. And in this, they, they just probably, you know, accepted it a long time ago. When I was living in Cleveland, though, I, I was uh, heavily in church. Um, I lived with a pastor. I was going to church three or four times a week. And I was involved uh, in the Pentecostal church. So I was studying, yeah. what's the guy's name? Herbert Armstrong. Yeah, Herbert W. Armstrong. Yeah, the Church of God in yeah. Christ. And uh, yeah. so I was had the lights off on Friday, yeah. and uh, Friday night until Saturday morning, and I was sitting up with old Miss Madden. She was old then. She's still living. So it's I, a miracle. She's, How do you... <laughs> right, she's got to be 100 or uh -huh. close to it because she was old in, in the early uh, 80s. But when you were there, were you feeling it? I mean, were you believing it? I tried, it? Dan. I tried. I wanted to speak in tongue. I thought it was fabulous that these people actually had a, a language that they were speaking. Huh. And I wanted to experience that. You know, I wanted to, to, yeah. to, to, to have that feeling of joy that was, you know, apparently uh, these people were experiencing in church. But it just, it just never yeah. happened. Now, I'll tell you, one of my aha moments, or people always ask me, what, what, how did you come out? What, was there a moment? And I remember asking you that. You said, well, Jeremiah, that's like asking me when did I grow up? And I kind of <laughs> feel the same way, but there was a moment in Cleveland when this guy, his name was Robert Chapman, I believe, and he used to come around, he'd always have change and jiggle change. And he said, man, you come to my church. I'm telling you, my pastor's going to blow you out the box. Because I had started to have some doubts. So I went to his church, and I kept waiting, and I kept waiting for this pastor. 
and he marched up and down saying the same thing I've been hearing since I was five years old. Mm. And so that led me to go and visit other churches and I realized they were all saying the same thing. And I was kind of confused as to why people were falling out over things that they had been hearing their whole lives. But they're also passing the hat while they're doing that. So. Several times, <laughs> you know, several times. And, um, you know, this is uh, part of why it's so hard to leave the church is uh, you have so much money invested in it, so much time you put into it. You've spent, you know, Sister Jones, have, she's put her life savings into this thing. This can't be wrong. Uh -huh. You know, your uncle's a deacon, your father's the pastor, your mom's on the finance board. You've got so much involved, so it's like this betrayal of your ancestors yeah. if you speak out against it. Not just a betrayal of the religion, but of your community, of your community. maybe of your race. You know, there is that ignorant stereotype that blacks, in America at least, are all churchgoers. You know, they're all just, you know, right. singing gospel choirs. Right. But, but you point out that there's a whole swath of minorities in this country. I mean, that, they don't get the attention, Dan. No. You know, there's a lot, and, and you know, I look at my circle. It's a lot smaller than it used to be. You know, as you get older, your circle kind of shrinks, and even though you know a thousand people, you people that you deal with is very small. But I, most of my friends and associates, they're like me. And that's, I guess, the law of attraction. I didn't go out and seek people who were non-believers. It's just, uh, you attract, those who are like you. And so being in this community, I've met a, a lot of people, you know, and the black non-believers as I travel around the country. There are so many black people who feel this way, but many of them are afraid to come out. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to come out. Uh, they, all, uh, they have this, this God void. What, what am I gonna do now? Who am I gonna worship now? Mm -hmm. They don't come out because of the pride, yeah. you know. Um, I've been believing this for so long, I, I, I just can't accept that but this is not it. the you, case. You found your way out and you, through thinking about reason and... Yeah, well, you've got a, ch a child's book that I, I, I purchased and you said, well, how do you know Santa Claus is not real? And one of the things you said was very plain. You said, you use your brain. Yeah, and you think. You just think about it. Yeah. It didn't, it wasn't a big leap for me, you know? And I tell people when they leave this thing, it's not a 15 story jump, <laughs> it's, it's less than two inches. So before we take a break here, sorry to interrupt you, but um, if, for a minute maybe could you talk about this idea that people in, in desperate straits, like in, in poor countries where there's misery or in poor neighborhoods, uh, isn't church kind of this Hail Mary hope that you're buying this cosmic lottery ticket that you're just going to drag you out of this misery? Do you think that's part of why you did the movie Contradiction? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I'll say the people that don't have are religious to obtain something. People that have that are religious are religious to maintain what, uh. they, what they have. So there's this struggle to obtain from the poor and, uh, and this pretense to maintain from the, from the rich. So we've been conditioned to think that, um, you know, that these are viable solutions, that prayer works, and there's just no evidence to support that. If prayer worked, blacks would not be on the bottom in so many areas. You wouldn't have been enslaved in the first place. And so you have a lot of blacks that resort to dipping Jesus in chocolate. <laughs> they make Jesus black. Is that like a good book title? Huh? Yeah. Dipping Jesus in right. chocolate. Right, which I find even more insulting. And I know you have to do what you have to do for your psychological reasons. But it's more insulting when you do that because here it is, you have a savior now that you say is black that still is okay with you be, being black on the bottom in so many areas. You're, this black savior's not even doing anything for you. Uh, there was uh, here at this event this weekend, I asked one of the waiters who was black, I said, listen, I said, you need to come in, you know, and check out my film, Holy Hierarchy. 
And she said, well, isn't this an atheist convention? I said, don't worry about that. I said, this God, you know, uh, what is he doing for black people anyway? Hmm. You know, we're on the bottom of every category, so what is he doing for you? Well, for the pastors are, have a good gig, but for everybody else. Yeah, yeah, they do, they do. And, you know, I was invited to, to come to seminarian school hmm. back in 2008. And I went for like six to eight months. So I wanted to see, I know you've been to seminarian school, you're a graduate, but I wanted to see what these pastors were in teaching these, these students you know, before they ministered out here in society. What were they learning? And one of the things that I, I learned while I was in the school was, they said, preach to the itching ear. Huh. In other words, tell the people what they want to hear, and not necessarily what they need to hear. Don't change the landscape. Don't deviate too much from what they're accustomed to hearing, because you're going to lose them then. After the break, we'll come back and look at a trailer for your next movie, Holy Hierarchies. And then I want to talk about a couple of the books that you wrote. We're talking with filmmaker Jeremiah Kamara. Stay tuned for more Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. Thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. You can find more content by the Freedom From Religion Foundation at our website, ffrf.org. Follow FFRF on Facebook and you'll get notifications about all of our content, including whenever we go live on FFRF's Ask an Atheist. FFRF is also on YouTube, where all of our programs, including this show and our weekly news bites are available to watch anytime. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you on the web. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're talking with the filmmaker and author, Jeremiah Kamara. And uh, c can we look at uh, the trailer for your movie, sure. Holy Hierarchies, The Religious Roots of Racism in America, right? That's correct. If we don't understand early Virginia, it'll be difficult to fully understand racism in America. Jesus was a white man too. We're going to protect Christianity. Jesus, he had a rough but kind face, sea blue eyes. Because Africans were not believers in Christ. Well, certainly I, I believe in, uh, in segregation because God teaches it. The Bible is a pillar of white supremacy. The white race is supreme by virtue of God's own blessing. White people want to see white angels, that's cool for white people. White is the norm for humanity. These other populations are not fully human in the way that whites are human. Now, none of these books are written by God. People say it doesn't matter what color Jesus is or what color whatever God they're worshiping is. I would strongly um, object to that. Images of God? and Mary and the apostles and the saints as white. Hebrew Bible, for example, was not opposed to the shedding of blood. So what a powerful statement. And you made this film in conjunction with the 400th anniversary of, was it the first slaves? Was it? Yeah, when the slave trade officially began in the United States in 1619. Wow. So can you summarize? Uh, what are the religious roots of slavery in America? Well, I tell people, if you don't understand Virginia, it'll be difficult or more challenging to understand racism the in America. The state of Virginia? The state of Virginia, because all the rest of the colonies followed Virginia's lead. Uh, I think seven of the first 10 presidents were from Virginia, and 10 of the first 12 owned uh, uh, enslaved blacks, you know? 
So Virginia was very prominent. They had a lot of the, the big players, uh, George Washington, um, Jefferson, Je uh, Jefferson, um, Je uh, Madison, yeah. Patrick Henry. Uh. So these were like big players and all the rest of the colonies followed. So the film attempts to explain how the beliefs in a biased supreme being led to beliefs in supreme human beings. You know, if you believe in a supreme being, it's a seamless transition to buy into supreme human beings. And how these beliefs work their way into the legal system, ultimately turning racism into an institution. So the title of your movie has the word hierarchy and this, this thought process in the human brain that there are levels of people, levels right. of there's clergy, there's leaders, there's monarchs, there's kings, there's lords, right. and then there's, that means there's people down here too. Absolutely. One of the most fundamental precepts during colonial times was that a god made whites to be superior over the inferior blacks. And there were laws written to even support that notion. A law was written in, I think, in 1667 that said God is on the side of the slave master. Mm -hmm. And so this, they, they codified this and, and, and put it into law and put it in the slave codes. So this notion of black inferiority has a legal uh, component to it. And that's why I say, what is racism? Racism has a legal component because racism is essentially the legal backing of a group's prejudices, uh, stereotypes, bigotry, um, beliefs, and ignorance. When that's legally backed, that becomes racism. Yeah, and that's in, what it does. In this country, people are free to be bigoted in their minds, right? right? But when it becomes public policy, that's where right. the problem. But it is true, as your film points out, that the Bible itself is the backing for those policies. The Bible itself is a slave manual. Even Jesus right. Jesus talked about how you shouldn't beat some slaves as hard as others because they didn't know better. It was just assumed that there was this lower class of people. Right. And so it, the, the Old Testament actually uh, supported the shedding of blood. And so it was never opposed to it. So these people saw this as a means to acquire what it is they wanted to, um, you know, do these acts to people who were not like them from a God-given, you know, order and support to, hey, it's okay to do this because the Bible looks at people that are different as a problem to solve. They did the same thing with the American Indians when uh, absolutely the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the Pequot Wars when the the British colonists came over and burned this village with children and women, everybody, they just burned them all. And a couple of preachers were saying, well, that doesn't sound very Christ-like. And then uh, others said, well, it's in the Bible. The Bible did that. They had genocides and killings. Right. So these people are not saved. Right. So anybody less than you deserves to. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, slavery was more economic driven, but racism was a justification for slavery. Yeah. How convenient, right? Right. Because you needed to just, you need to sleep at night. So you justified enslaving by saying, you know, these people are not really fully human like we are. So we're going to enslave them for the economic gains we can get, but we're going to invent racism to justify it because they weren't fully human. Uh -huh. And this is what happened. And the rest of the colonies got their lead from Virginia. Well, that's kind of the history of the human race. I mean, all the, a lot of these wars are based on the enemy being, you know, the Japanese or these people being less than human beings, which gives us then this authority to. Right. So you wrote a book called uh, Holy, Lock Holy Lockdown, Does the Church Limit Black Progress? And <laughs> that book, I look for books, you know, as a president's to pull from. There was nothing like that. It's probably the first book written that, criticize the institution of the black church. And what that book does, it, it again looks at the saturation of churches in black community coexisting with poverty and powerlessness. Again, why are there so many churches yet so many problems? So why lockdown? What's the word lockdown? Uh... Lockdown, uh, my media company is called 12 House Media and in astrology, uh, symbol, symbol, 
uh, symbolically speaking, the 12th house is the house of prisons. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that blacks are in, in, in a form of religious prison, in a, in a lock, state of lockdown, because it's so difficult to pull away from it. We think that the church is our culture, but it's a, something that was imposed upon us. And there's a conflation of church and black movement, you know, somehow being, uh, the religion somehow benefits these movements. The church was simply a building. It was the only built place really that we could come and meet. Kind of like the water cooler where you could find- That's where you go, there. that's where yeah. you go. And that's where, even to this day, a lot of our movements are held in the church. And no matter what goes down in the community, the first thing the preacher says is, let us pray. Hmm. When you do that, you're establishing a mindset that's now going to expect godly intervention on a project that is entirely human in scope. Well, you're doing some great work and very creative work. Your films are just a joy to watch, and, and you learn a lot. I mean, there's some cringing moments in them, but let's not shy away from the truth. Well, exactly. thank you. Thank Thanks you, Jeremiah me, Kamara. Appreciate that. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters, because free thought matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.